The Bird Market by Anton Chekhov. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bird Market by Anton Chekhov. There is a small square near the monastery of the Holy Birth which is called Trubnoy, or simply Trubhoy. There is a market there on Sundays. Hundreds of sheepskins, wadded coats, fur caps, and chimney-pot hats swarm there, like crabs in a sieve. There is the sound of the twitter of birds in all sorts of keys, recalling the spring. If the sun is shining, and there are no clouds in the sky, the singing of the birds and the smell of hay makes a more vivid impression, and this reminder of spring sets one thinking, and carries one's fancy far, far away. Along one side of the square there stands a string of wagons. The wagons are loaded, not with hay, not with cabbages nor beans, but with goldfinches, siskins, larks, blackbirds, thrushes, blue tits, bluefinches. All of them are hopping about in rough homemade cages, twittering and looking with envy at the free sparrows. The goldfinches cost five kopecks. The siskins are rather more expensive, while the value of the other birds is quite indeterminate. How much is a lark? The seller himself does not know the value of a lark. He scratches his head and asks whatever comes into it a rouble or three kopecks, according to the purchaser. There are expensive birds, too. A faded old blackbird, with most of its feathers plucked out of its tail, sits on a dirty perch. He is dignified, grave, and motionless as a retired general. He has waved his claw in resignation to his captivity long ago, and looks at the blue sky with indifference. Probably owing to this indifference, he is considered a sagacious bird. He is not to be bought for less than forty kopecks. Schoolboys, workmen, young men in stylish grey coats, and bird fanciers in incredibly shabby caps, in ragged trousers that are turned up at the ankles, and look as though they had been gnawed by mice, crowd round the birds, splashing through the mud. The young people and the workmen are sold hens for cocks, young birds for old ones. They know very little about birds, but there is no deceiving the bird fancier. He sees and understands his bird from a distance. There is no relying on that bird, a fancier will say, looking into a siskin beak and counting the feathers on his tail. He sings now, it is true, but what of that? I sing in company, too. No, my boy, shout. Sing to me without company. Sing in solitude, if you can. You give me that one, yonder, that sits and holds its tongue. Give me the quiet one. That one says nothing. So he thinks the more. Among the wagons of birds there are some full of other live creatures. Here you see hares, rabbits, hedgehogs guinea-pigs, polecats. A hare sits sorrowfully nibbling the straw. The guinea-pigs shiver with cold, while the hedgehogs look out with curiosity from under their prickles at the public. "'I have read somewhere,' says the post-office official in a faded overcoat, looking lovingly at the hare and addressing no one in particular, "'I have read that some learned man had a cat and a mouse and a falcon and a sparrow, who all ate out of one bowl. That's impossible, sir. The cat must have been beaten, and the falcon, I dare say, had all its tail pulled out. There's no great cleverness in that, sir. A friend of mine who had a cat who, saving your presence, used to eat his cucumbers. He thrashed her with a big whip for a fourth night till he taught her not to. A hare can learn to light matches if you beat it. Does that surprise you? It's very simple. It takes the match in its mouth and strikes it. 
An animal is like a man. A man's made wiser by beating, and it's the same with a beast. Men in long, fur-skirted coats moved backwards and forwards in the crowd, with cocks and ducks under their arms. The fowls were all lean and hungry. Chickens poked their ugly, mangy-looking heads out of their cages and peck at something in the mud. Boys with pigeons stare into your face and try to detect in you a pigeon fancier. Yes, indeed, it's no use talking to you, someone shouts angrily. You should look before you speak. Do you call this a pigeon? It's an eagle, not a pigeon. A tall, thin man with a shaven upper lip and side whiskers, who looks like a sick and drunken footman, is selling a snow white lapdog. The lapdog whines. She told me to sell the nasty thing, said the footman with a contemptuous snigger. She's bankrupt in her old age, has nothing to eat, and here now is selling her dogs and cats. She cries and kisses them on their filthy snouts, and then she is so hard up that she sells them. Upon my soul, is that a fact? Buy it, gentlemen. The money is wanted for coffee. But no one laughs. A boy who is standing by screws up one eye and looks at him gravely with compassion. The most interesting of all is the fish section. Some dozen peasants are sitting in a row. Before each of them is a pail, and in each pail there is a veritable little hell. There, in the thick greenish water, are swarms of little carp, eels, small fry, water snails, frogs, and newts. Big water beetles with broken legs scurry over the small surface, clambering on the carp and jumping over the frogs. The creatures have a strong hold on life. The frogs climb on the beetles, the newts on the frogs. The dark green tench, as more expensive fish, enjoy an exceptional position. They are kept in a special jar where they can't swim, but still they are not so cramped. The carp is a grand fish. The carp's the fish to keep, Your Honor. Plague take him. You can keep him for a year in a pail, and he'll live. It's a week since I caught these very fish. I caught them, sir, in Pererva, and have come from there on foot. The carp are two kopecks each. The eels are three. And the minnows are ten kopecks the dozen. Plague take them all. Five kopecks worth of minnows, sir? Won't you take some worms? The seller thrusts his coarse rough fingers into the pail and pulls out of it a soft minnow, or a little carp, the size of a nail. Fishing lines, hooks, and tackle are laid out near the pails, and pond worms glow with a crimson light in the sun. An old fancier in a fur cap, iron-rimmed spectacles, and galoshes that look like two dreadnoughts, walks about by the wagons of the birds and pails of fish. He is, as they call him here, a type. He hasn't a farthing to bless himself with, but in spite of that he haggles, gets excited, and pesters purchasers with advice. He has thoroughly examined all the hares, pigeons, and fish. Examine them in every detail. Fix the kind, the age, and the price of each one of them a good hour ago. He is as interested as a child in the goldfinches, the carp, and the minnows. Talk to him, for instance, about thrushes, and the queer old fellow will tell you things you could not find in any book. He will tell you them with enthusiasm, with passion and will scold you, too, for your ignorance. Of goldfinches and bullfinches he is ready to talk endlessly, opening his eyes wide and gesticulating violently with his hands. He is only to be met here at the market in the cold weather. In the summer he is somewhere in the country catching quails with a bird call and angling for fish. And here is another type. A very tall, very thin, close-shaven gentleman with dark spectacles, wearing a cap with a cockade, and looking of a scrivener of bygone days. 
he is a fancier, and he is a man of decent position, a teacher in a high school, and is well known to be the habitues of the market. And they treat him with respect, greeting him with bows, and have even invented for him a special title, Your Scholarship. At Suharev Market he rummages among the books, and to Trebnoy he looks out for good pigeons. Please, sir, the pigeon seller shouts out to him, Mr. Schoolmaster, your scholarship? Take notice of my Trebners, your scholarship. Your scholarship, an urchin repeats somewhere in the boulevard. And his scholarship, apparently quite accustomed to his title, grave and serene, takes a pigeon in both hands, and lifting it above his head, begins examining it. And as he does, so frowns and looks graver than ever, like a conspirator. And Trubnoy Square, that little bit of Moscow where animals are so tenderly loved, and where they are so tortured, lives its little life, grows noisy and excited, and the business-like or pious people who pass by along the boulevard cannot make out what has brought this crowd of people this medley of caps, fur hats, and chimney-pots, together. What they are talking about there, what they are buying and selling. End of The Bird Market by Anton Chekhov Read by Alan Davis Drake